you know, it's funny. What the dying don't regret is they don't regret what they failed at, which is so interesting. They regret what they were too afraid to try. And I said, aha, like the dying have a lot to tell us about what's important, what isn't important. And when they get to their end of life, what do they regret? And I just felt like that could teach all of us younger people who are not terminally ill. What kind of things should we be thinking about now so we don't have those regrets? Yeah, the dying can teach us a lot about living. Yeah, I think you're exactly right where there's a lot of discussion about, you know, and we do it here at Financial Feminist about, you know, how to budget, how to save, how to start investing. But I think there's there's less discussion of, okay, I got that together, what happens next? And so what sort of themes or, or you know, you said you were talking to people, what did they bring up a lot? Like, what were the common threads that you heard? So especially with the dying, what I'd find is that they didn't regret not working nights and weekends. They didn't regret not hitting some type of net worth number. What they mostly regretted is that there were these themes in their life, these things of importance, and they never had the courage or time to explore them. It wasn't what they failed at in life. It's what they didn't put enough time into. And we have this habit of putting off important things in our life. And often, believe it or not, money becomes an excuse because we think about money and it becomes central in our lives of what we're spending our time and thought process doing. The harder stuff, stuff like who am I and what do I want out of this life, we tend to put that aside because it's kind of scary to deal with. Yeah, it's a big it's a big question that no one really has the answer for. Yeah, and it's you know to face the sense of what is meaning in my life and what am I meant to do really almost puts this aspect of how finite life is. Like when we start thinking yeah. about this is what I was meant to do, then we also have to say that there is a limited amount of time and I might try and not get there. So it's much easier to say, well, I'm going to put that off for another day because right now I just need to make sure that I got a job. I need to make sure I'm making enough money, that I'm putting food on the table, all exceedingly important. But some of it does become an excuse to not do the harder things to pinpoint. Like money can be hard. We know that, right? Making money can right. be hard. Saving can be hard. But we know the steps. They're really definable. Uh, it's a lot harder to say, what are the steps to figure out what my purpose in life is? What are the steps <laughs> to really get a hold of my identity? And so we skip out on that tougher stuff because... It, it's it's emotional and difficult. Yeah. Would you say that it was people expressing, I think you, you said actually already, like the regret, right? Of like, I didn't do this or I wish I had done this. You know what it is? It's regret that they didn't put more energy into those things that were important, mm. right? Mm. And so, you know, some people love travel. So is it regret that they didn't go to that place? No, it's regret that they didn't put the time and space aside in their life to do travel on a more regular Got basis. It. Or it's that thing that you really always wanted to do and were afraid to do. For some people, it's building a business, right? So this idea of, yeah. oh, I really want to start this business and it scares the heck out of us. And so we don't try. And that's where I think, you know, it's funny. What the dying don't regret is they don't regret what they failed at, which is so interesting. Yeah. They regret what they were too afraid to try. Try, yeah. And that, that really had an effect on me because I think we are so afraid of failure that sometimes it stops us right at the beginning. Well, I think a lot of times with failure, I know in my own life, when it, it, the act of failing felt like such a huge like blip in the radar of my life, right? Like when I was in it, when I, you know, didn't, didn't get the promotion that I thought I would, or when I made a mistake in my business or when I, you know, didn't show up in a relationship how I wanted to, those felt like these huge, massive, catalytic events. And a, the majority of the time I've looked back on them as learning moments or as like, oh, I'm really glad that happened because it informed me now, as opposed to feeling like that was going to, you know, scar me for life or something like that. And funny enough, I mean, I think it's sometimes when we're failing or at least trying audaciously that we're most alive, right? It's when you're oh, in the yeah. arena fighting the fight. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, Brown. that's the thing. And sometimes we forget. And this is another thing I think the dying really helped me with. And, and as I try to think about my life and, and all of our lives, how we kind of find happiness, this idea of happiness often isn't really about the end goal or the end product. A lot of it is about the process. And so that 
process of failing, of doing something of important, of leaving it all on the table. I mean, that I think is actually what our lives are made up of. Um, the, end, the end result or the end goal is, is sometimes like icing on the cake. Like you might get it, you might not. Uh, and if you happen to get it, it's, it's excellent. Yeah. And I, I, you know, you said braving the arena and I think of Brene Brown immediately. Right. And her work around vulnerability of like, I think being vulnerable is being human. That is the human experience. And yeah, when I, you know, I'm, I'm relatively young. And when I look back at my life, like my favorite moments have been when I've tried something new, even if it didn't go well. Right. Or if I was vulnerable or, you know, uh, tried, yeah, tried something outside of what felt comfortable. And you know what I love about your listeners and the population you really speak to is, you know, we're really talking about young people. So when right. I talk about these things about money and the role it plays in our lives, and now that my book is out, you know, I get all this positive feedback from people in their 40s or 50s or 60s. But really, the most powerful time to start thinking about these things is when you're in your 20s and 30s. I mean, right. that's the point where you can really start bringing in purpose and identity into your life. And doing a lot better than those of us who saw money as an end goal to such an extent that once we got there, we didn't know what the heck to do with ourselves. Yeah, it's not the it, I always joke that like I don't want a stack of government issued paper like that doesn't <laughs> get me anything. <laughs> you know, it's what money can buy me or the flexibility that I have when I have spending money when I have, you know, fin when I've achieved financial independence. It's not just yeah. Like, I don't want Benjamin Franklin's face on some tree babies. Like, mm -hmm. that doesn't get me anything. <laughs> yeah, so the pursuit of money just for the pursuit of it is not, it's not worth anything. And what I remember, you know, one of the fun things, story about having you on my show is I remember some of your story and things like the vending machines and that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Like, those things that we do when we're young, those young businesses, those kind of things, end up being joyful experiments. Like were, when we get yeah. older, it becomes this business we have to do because we have to make money and it gets really stressful. But, yeah. but I see a lot of joy in some of those early experiments. So it's not like our passions can't lead to money. And in fact, I think often, especially if we start young enough and are thoughtful about it, a lot of times they do. And that's what's so kind of cool about it. Thanks for remembering that, by the way. That's very thoughtful. Yeah. Thank you.